presentar al profesor Paul Dickinson, Wilkinson, que es profesor de Epidemiología Ambiental en el Centro para el Cambio Climático y la Salud Planetaria de la Escuela de Londres de Higiene y Medicina Tropical. Eh, bueno, el profesor es un grandísimo experto epidemiológico clínico, cuyos intereses en el campo de la investigación se centran en el cambio climático y la salud global, los efectos en la salud de la contaminación ambiental, salud urbana, vivienda y desarrollo sostenible. Ha trabajado muchos años eh, para la Organización Mundial de la Salud en aspectos relacionados con su área de expertise, que efectivamente es cambio climático y salud, y es miembro del Comité Británico sobre los efectos médicos de la contamina los contaminantes del aire. También ha trabajado mucho tiempo en investigación acerca de enfermedades, relacionadas, enfermedades de pulmón y de corazón relacionadas con la contaminación. En fin, que creo que esta presentación es muy prometedora, sobre todo porque me parece que va a abordar una temática que quizá nos toque más de cerca. Quizá el tema del calentamiento global lo vemos como algo más lejano, pero el impacto que tiene el cambio climático en nuestra salud probablemente nos toque más de cerca. ¿no? Así que, sin más eh, presentaciones, le doy la palabra al profesor Paul Wilkinson. Please, profesor. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to speak about climate change and health. Um, I'm very happy to be interrupted as I go along. If you have questions, don't understand things, think I'm talking rubbish, which many people do, uh, or would otherwise like to elaborate on some of the issues uh, as they come up. I think it's better that than to save everything for the end, um, but I leave it to you. Now, whenever I'm asked to speak about climate change and health, I generally make an important distinction. The first is about the health impacts that arise as a result of climate change. But there is a second group of impacts relating to climate change, which are not the consequences of climate change, but the consequences of our action to try to avoid it. That is to say, those actions that we take to try to mitigate, to avoid climate change happening in the first place, the, trans the, uh, the transition to the low carbon economy they have immediate effects on health which are generally beneficial. And for many reasons, I, uh, I like to draw attention at least as much to those effects from trying to uh, move to a low carbon economy because I think that their gain is more immediate, often larger and less uncertain than some of those relating to the avoidance of future climate change. So all the way through, I will be talking about these two different things. The first is the impact of climate change itself on us, but the second is the health effects of those actions we, we can take to try to avoid climate change. And it's not the avoidance of climate change itself that matters, but it's all of those ancillary things that go on reducing air pollution and so on as a result of that low carbon transition. Now let me begin with um, a very broad uh, diagram here that tries to connect a lot of the different parts of climate change to health effects. Now this is a very old slide. I've been using it for at least 20 years. Um, it says 2000, but actually there was a version of it appearing even before the year 2000. Um, and what it outlines is simply the fact that climate change, of course, results in local weather um, and changes in the patterns of that local weather. And there are direct effects relating to changes in temperature, most notably, I suppose, heat waves, extreme weather events, precipitation events, that is, changes in rainfall, drought, and so on. Um, and they may have both direct and indirect effects on health. 
as you'll see in a minute, and as I'm sure you realize, high temperatures themselves are bad for health, or can be, uh, and so too are extreme weather events. But there are also a number of things, perhaps with larger impacts on health, that arise through indirect pathways. And they affect things such as the transmission of vector-borne diseases, that is, mosquito diseases and so on, uh, crop production, air pollution levels, and so on. And of course, across all of this, we are all the time taking actions to uh, limit some of the adverse effects, adapting to the changing uh, environment, and so on. Now, let's begin with something which is very uh, easy and clear and obvious, I hope. This is the famous uh, heat wave of the year 2003. And these are the data for Paris. So uh, along the, the bars here represent the number of deaths per day. And the black bars are the deaths occurring in 2003, the year of the heat wave. So it's just simply date along the x-axis going from uh, the 25th of June through to the 15th of September. So here is the obvious heat wave period in the middle. The black line shows the temperature trace. And so the heat wave is roughly that period I'm indicating now. And what you can see is that the black bars show um, a huge increase in the number of deaths per day. Uh, this is done on an absolute scale, so zero is the bottom line, and the normal number of deaths is about 50 in this administrative area of Paris. But during the period of the heat wave, the deaths started to rise, and they went up to over 300 per day, which is a six-fold increase in the number of deaths. And if you l l take the data for other years, you can see with maybe that there are lighter gray bars here, those show you the deaths per day that occurred in the, the years 1999 to 2002, and they stayed, much, they stayed flat, they stayed below the 50 per day or thereabouts, so that we can be pretty sure that that excess there is unusual, it's related to the heat, it's a six-fold increase in risk at the peak, and if you count the, the length of those bars above there or thereabouts, that represents the total number of excess deaths due to heat during that episode. Um, and that sort of plot makes it very easy to see that when temperatures do get to high extremes, that there are appreciable increases in the risk of death and perhaps large burdens associated with it. Across Europe, the estimates are of maybe 40 to 50,000 excess deaths in total during the heat wave episode associated with the 2003 ep episode. But temperature is a very um, complicated thing. What I now show you, this is data, I could have taken any number of cities, but I happen to have most readily at hand data for London. And this is the plot of the relationship between temperature and mortality risk. So the y-axis shows the multiplication of risk relative to the, the days with the temperature at which fewest deaths occur. That's this point here. At that temperature, which in London is about 19 Celsius, fewer deaths occur per day at that temperature than on any other day. If you go to a hotter day, more deaths occur. If you go to a colder day, more deaths occur. But that's the minimum mortality temperature, about 19 Celsius. And you can see how much you multiply the risk as you go to cold end or to, to the hot end. So this is simply the, uh, the average temperature, I think. And you can see that temperatures above here, there is a fairly steep and rapid rise in temperature. But also, as you go to colder temperatures, 
indicated in blue for cold, that there is also a risk, and that also gets very steep when you get to very low temperatures. Now, there are several things to observe about this. Although this is London, you get a pattern that looks very similar to this, maybe not in exact form, but in almost any population you look at anywhere in the world. That includes populations living in tropical countries. It includes people living in Arctic climates. In almost every setting, there will be a temperature at which you begin to see heat deaths and a temperature at which you begin to see cold deaths. And we are pretty certain that these are genuinely temperature-related deaths. And the reason that we are so certain is because this curve is essentially based on comparing the number of deaths per day in the same population. So the people living in London today are, to a very, 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 very good approximation, the same people who lived in London yesterday. So if there are more deaths today than there were yesterday, it's not because the population has suddenly changed. There has to be some extrinsic factor causing it that changes from one day to the next. And there aren't that many things that do change from one day to the next. Pollution, but for reasons I'm not going to go into in detail now, pollution affects uh, actually a much weaker than you see for temperature here. What else changes day to day? Well, not much, but there are seasonal um, flu epidemics and seasonal infections, and they can have an effect. But we control for all of those. And if you control for pollution and you control for seasonal infections, there isn't much left to explain the day-by-day -day variation in deaths. And so we end up with um, a pretty certain interpretation that all of that red bit is a genuine temperature effect, a heat effect, and all of that is the cold effect. Now, another thing of notice is that if you observe this set of bars here is the distribution of temperatures. So it shows that most temperatures in London are actually moderate temperatures. They're in the middle here. There are only a few up here at the high end, and there are only a few down there at the very cold end. Now, because there aren't very many days up here, although the risk rises steeply with heat, with high temperature, it translates into not very many deaths. There are many more days down here which, is, which are below the threshold at which the cold effect starts to accumulate, and there are many more deaths from cold in London. But surprisingly, that conclusion is true for almost every population. This is a set of countries from around the world, and you'll notice that they, um, we don't have Spain. Oh, yes, we do have Spain on there. Um, and this is the data for it. And you'll notice there are four bars. There are two red, or a, a darker red and a lighter red, or orange, and two blue, a lighter and a darker blue. And essentially, I won't go into the precise definitions, but the, the lighter blue is moderate cold, and the deep blue is extreme cold. And as you may guess, the lighter red is moderate heat and extreme heat. And in every country, and that includes Thailand, uh, it includes Brazil, the cold deaths are greater than the heat deaths. Um, and that's true also in Spain, so those of us who come from the UK think of Spain as a hot country, relatively speaking. I know it can get very cold in certain periods uh, of the year, but the overall pattern is that there are more cold deaths than heat. Um, moreover, the days of extreme tend not to be, uh, tend to account for no more than the days of moderate heat uh, or moderate cold. So here, all of these are moderately cold days, so that's when it would be, I don't know, 15 Celsius, 10 Celsius, 5 Celsius maximum temperature, but not minus 5, not 0. Uh, and that is where the majority of, of deaths occur. 
Um, so this raises various interesting observations. The first is that for this is the current situation, and so under the current climate, we have a lot of temperature-related deaths. There are more of them which are cold-related by an order of magnitude. There are roughly 10 times more cold deaths than there are heat deaths. And most of them occur under conditions of rather moderate temperature difference, so moderate cool or moderate heat. Um, it's actually a relatively small number that are accounted for by the extremes of heat, the very hot days. And that's partly because, although the risks are high on those days, there aren't very many extremely hot days. Now, if I go backwards, though, that what you can guess is that as the temperature distribution shifts towards the right, there we will bring more and more into this part of the risk distribution. So you can imagine some of these bars here will start to shift above the threshold. And therefore, because this is such a steep curve, you, you may imagine that the heat deaths are likely to rise quite steeply. And that is what we guess will happen, all other things being equal. But the statement, all other things being equal, is important because, of course, things don't stay still. We adapt. We find better ways of cooling our buildings, cooling our motor cars, cooling shopping centers, of protecting ourselves against these risks. And it's therefore quite difficult to understand exactly what the future burden of direct temperature-related uh, risks to, to, uh, to life are. These are all mortality risks. Um, and of course, there are uh, risks of morbidity, of illness as well. Um, but we tend to analyze deaths because deaths are very clear. Um, you can count to death very easily. It's, it's, there's not usually too much doubt about whether, whether somebody has died or not. There is doubt over whether somebody has certain forms of illness or not. So this, first of all, just provides a background to the kind of issue of temperature-related adverse effects on health. But notice that I think both ends of the spectrum have importance for us, because the heat end is important because we need, in a warming world, to be able to protect ourselves against a shift in distribution towards some of these very high uh, end of the temperature distribution where risks are likely to rise quite dramatically. And that will lead to a fairly large shift in exposures. We've had record-breaking temperatures in Europe this year. We had very high temperatures in 2006. We had very high temperatures in 2003. The estimate is that the, the the, the 2003 episode by mid-century will become something like an every other year event rather than a 500, one in a 500 year event, which is the frequency with which uh, it has been reckoned to have occurred so far. So there'll be a hot end we need to guard against, but there is also already an existing burden of people suffering from cold-related illness and we have evidence from, not so much from Spain, but from other settings, that that burden can in part be reduced by improving the quality of things like housing. And if you make housing more energy efficient, you insulate it better, you protect against uh, uh, low temperature risks, that can help to diminish some of the burden. So surprisingly, of the actions that we may take against climate change, there may be at least as much benefit from helping to reduce some of this cold end by improving the thermal efficiency of our dwellings as there is by adapting to some of these high risk uh, temperatures uh, um, above the heat threshold. Um, I'll elaborate more on this as I go through. So this is just simply some of the background about the very direct effects of uh, high temperature and, and low temperature. Now, as you may imagine, there are all sorts of other risks that arise as well. Um, and one of the things that people are very keen to understand is about the risks of uh, the spread of infectious diseases, and in particular about the spread of vector-borne diseases, such as malaria, dengue, chikungunya, and a number of other vector-borne diseases. 
And that is all based on very good logical reasoning from evidence such as this, which is derived from the laboratory. So what this uh, plot shows is a set of characteristics about the mosquito and the parasite that transmit malaria. And it shows three parameters, the frequency with which the mos mosquito bites, how long the mosquito survives, and the incubation period for the parasite, all of them as a function of temperature. And what you see is that the higher the temperature goes, the more frequently mosquitoes bite. Uh, there is an optimal temperature for the uh, survival uh, probability of a mosquito, and it's somewhere in the high 20s, low 30s Celsius. And the incubation period of the parasite is, uh, is long at low temperatures and gets shorter and shorter and shorter at high temperatures. And if you put those three things together, you get what you have on the bottom curve, which is the kind of integration of those effects, which is what's often labeled as the transmission potential. And what that shows very obviously is that the risk of transmission is highest here when you get to high temperatures uh, around about 30 Celsius. I think these are um, average daily temperatures. And at that point, uh, it is easiest for malaria to be transmitted. Now, because of that, there are a lot of people who look at the data and say, therefore, where temperatures rise such that we move into the temperatures which are uh, optimal for the transmission of malaria, that is going to increase malaria in those areas. Um, and that is very reasonable reasoning because these are all very well established relationships. You can generate them all under controlled experimental conditions in the laboratory. And what happens if you take evidence like that and you apply it, it, it shows that around the world there are likely to be shifts in the distribution of malaria so that it's going to move north from the current edge of the distribution, probably into areas uh, towards the, the bottom of where it is currently distributed. And that may mean moving into southern Europe in particular. So Areas uh, at the very uh, at low latitude in Europe may well be targets for where there is extension of malaria transmission. Just as there will be uh, moving southward from the current areas of, of, of distribution uh, down to further uh, uh, latitudes uh, in southern Africa, in uh, South America, and so on. So extension both north and south from the current distribution. But first thing to remember is uh, malaria used to be present quite widely throughout Europe. Uh, we even had it in the UK and in parts of Scandinavia, which are very cool. If you read novels by Charles Dickens, written in the 19th century, some of the illnesses, the fevers that he describes are almost certainly malaria illnesses, malaria fevers. We have got rid of malaria, though, not because temperatures have become less suitable for malaria transmission, quite the reverse. We've got warmer s since the 19th century by about a degree. Uh, but we have broken the chain of, of infection because the climate alone is only one factor among many that give rise to uh, risk of malaria transmission. The other things relate to breeding grounds for mosquitoes, so swampy areas, areas of water, uh, whether people can get bitten in their homes. And we have broken the chain of infection in Europe uh, largely because we have drained marshy areas for agriculture. We now live in dwellings with close-fitting windows and doors. We don't get bitten by mosquitoes much. We don't work in the fields much. 
everything else has tipped against malaria transmission. So the important thing to remember about most of these illnesses, there is a balance going on all the time of climate factors on the one hand, but all manner of other influences, environmental, social, healthcare, that act in the opposite direction. And some years ago, there was a paper published in Nature from which I've taken these plots that have looked at the change in the distribution of malaria in the world since about 1900. So the top map shows the distribution as it was in 1900, and then the bottom map shows the distribution as the best it could be determined uh, for the year 2007, which was a few years before the paper was published. Um, and what you can see is that the colors are fairly obvious. The darker the green is, the more heavily endemic, the more malaria present. And what has happened over that time, as you can see, is that malaria has shrunk rather than expanded. And that is because of all of those other factors that have led to the uh, tipping of the balance away from the spread of malaria. And the authors of this paper concluded that um, over the course of the last century or so, comparing the top map to the bottom, that the influence of non-climatic factors were probably an order of magnitude, if not two order of orders of magnitude, more powerful, more important than those of the climate alone. And therefore, for us, happily, over this time, the climate factor has actually has been outweighed. The world has got warmer a little over that period, but all these other factors have led to uh, retraction uh, of the areas of malaria endemicity. The question for us, though, now is that having, a having got to the point where we now are, with a larger climate signal, whether this now will start to reverse and spread back into some of those areas that were hitherto um, uh, were malaria endemic areas and which will now be favored more with climate change. One of the good things is that our propensity, our ability to control through control measures, draining swamps, spraying of insects, etc., cetera, um, are clearly part of the reason also of why we've, had, we've now got less distribution of malaria than we once had, and that they will remain, for the time being at least, reasonably effective when, there are, when, there is, when we're talking about the spread of malaria at the margins of the current distribution. So the question that everybody asks then, well, will we therefore get malaria or not in, in Europe, or more malaria than we've had in recent past? And so the, the answer to that is, I'm not entirely sure. It's a kind of on a knife edge, exactly what will happen. The pressure is that there will be some movement into uh, particularly low latitudes within Europe, I think, over time. But it remains a bit of an open question to me. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the, the, sh the difference in the distribution will be over time. Um, this just is a map of the change in falciparum malaria over that period, uh, and a, a noting that here this is sort of the, sub the subtraction of the of the bottom curve from the top curve, uh, sorry, bottom map from the top map, and you can see because these colours are blue, that represents a negative change, i.e., reduction or removal of malaria endemicity. Well, that's malaria, but there are other diseases too. Now, this doesn't directly affect us so much in Europe yet, probably, um, but this is another vector-borne disease, dengue. And dengue has spread a lot over the last 50, 50 years. It used to be contained to relatively small pockets uh, uh, around the globe, but it has been spreading. We cannot say primarily because of climate change, but it's been spreading for a variety of reasons, including movement of people, of ships which carry some of the disease vectors, and so on around the world. But dengue, more probably than uh, 
malaria is sensitive to temperature changes. And this, uh, it may not be very easy to compare these maps, but they are estimated burdens of dengue occurrence holding everything constant except for project projected climate change and how they will vary over time. So this one is 2020, this one is 2080. And, um, well, very simply, it goes from no risk is the gray end up to dark red, which is almost certain uh, permanently endemic populations of dengue. And uh, it's not a dramatic change, but you can see that the patterns here are much redder, much more orange than they were here. And if you look carefully, you can see at the edges here that, that things are spreading. And uh, this is um, a plot of the land area suitable for dengue transmission, as best we can compute it, against year. So here is the baseline year 2015 of data. And these are then projections for 2020, 2050, 2080. And you can see the circles represent different places. So the top row here is Africa. And you can see in Africa, dengue transmission is rising. And so too, but at a much sm slower rate, probably also in Asia, um, uh, Europe is right down here. We're probably safe for dengue for the time being. But the rest of the world is not. And, it, and, it is, and, it, and it's likely to spread. Now, I'm gonna, I'll talk a bit more about some other health effects as we go through, but I now want to change gear a little bit because I want to address partly the, the um, objectives of the meeting here, which, are, as I understand, are about issues of environmental justice, about equity, about fairness, uh, inequality. Um, and you'll all have your own definitions, and I'm just using one. That, so when I'm talking about environmental justice, uh, this is well, will be achieved when everyone enjoys the same degree of protection against environmental and health hazards and, uh, and has equal access to the decision-making process to have a healthy environment in which to live, learn, and work. Now, it's important to, to note this because so much of the climate change debate, there are issues of uh, fairness, of environmental justice, of inequality, of geographical variation, which affect where the burdens lie and, and who generates those burdens. I wanted, though, also to comment at this stage about the development trajectory. There's this famous curve, um, which is an adaptation of an, of an economist curve. Kuznets was, a, uh, I think, a US economist who generated a curve looking at the, the, way, uh, of, uh, the way wealth distribution uh, evolves over time. The pattern from it, though, has been adapted to environmental impacts. And what it shows is the, the change in the severity of different forms of environmental impact as you, go for, uh, as you get wealthier. So the x-axis here represents wealth. Poor populations down here, wealthy populations up there, and it's just an increasing wealth as you go from left to right. And what you see is that there are three levels of exposure. At the low level, the exposures that occur are mainly household. This is poor people living in, in poor homes where there is inadequate sanitation. Maybe they are heating their home and cooking by burning biomass, by which I mean wood and dry dung and things like that to heat their home without proper ventilation, and it gives rise to very large uh, burdens of particle concentrations inside the home, far, far, far higher in concentration than any outdoor air pollution we get in, in U European cities, for example. But the risk of those problems arising from household level risks, sanitation, indoor air quality, and so on, falls almost linearly or very rapidly as you get increasing wealth, such that when you're in a population that's uh, very, uh, highly developed, there are really usually quite low levels of most household risks. The second curve, 
which goes up and down, is the one of community level pollution. And this occurs, it reaches a peak at middle income. So this is the kind of Chinese city where they're going through rapid economic development, they're midway in their economic uh, progress, where community level pollution arises at its greatest. And so they have, in particular, a problem of outdoor air pollution, which I might say, and we were discussing this a bit over lunch, the evidence is they are now conquering that rapidly and very dramatically. They are reducing their concentrations uh, step by step every year uh, in quite dramatic fashion. The last line, which is represented by this dotted curve, shows the issue of increasing wealth. As you get wealthier, the emissions that arise are those of consumption. And the thing that's, that's uh, par excellence here, of course, is the greenhouse gases. So in rich countries, such as Spain, actually, there are a few problems of household pollution. Even urban air pollution is pretty small now. It's not negligible, but it's relatively low. But we still have the problem of greenhouse gas emissions, and we've yet to find our peak. So that's the way the transition works. And the problem is that this, of course, is a global impact. So the people down here also suffer from the greenhouse gas effects, which are being emitted by the wealthy populations. Um, I probably don't need to dwell on that on this slide. It's just making the point about environmental justice also means equitable distribution of environmental risks and benefits, as well as the other things. And it's that distribution of risks and benefits that I'm going to concentrate on a bit. And I'm also going to remind you that for any given level of it, um, or there are three ways in which inequalities arise from environmental impact. You can either be exposed to more than everybody else is, so this is the uh, poorer people being exposed to higher levels of ambient air pollution, for example. Or you may be more vulnerable than other people to the same level of air pollution. And this is the fact that uh, it's possible that uh, poorer populations are intrinsically less able to deal with uh, the same level of exposure as, say, wealthier populations are. And thirdly, that the underlying disease risk may be greater, such that when air pollution multiplies that risk, it's multiplying a greater baseline rate of disease. So even if there is no difference in exposure, it may be that poorer populations will also suffer from greater disease burdens because of their underlying disease risk. Now, I'm now going to, thinking of those different dimensions of the environmental justice argument, I'm going to talk about health impacts with regard to three levels of, uh, or three differentials. Geographical, socioeconomic, which also relates to things like race and gender and age, and intergenerational. So firstly, geography. Now, you know... First of all, I'm sure you'll have seen various versions of this sort of map. This is a map of the world, but it's been distorted to show which countries are contributing most to the greenhouse gas emissions. So Africa has gone on a severe diet. This is the African continent has shrunk right down here. But this is Europe. There's the UK. Here is Spain, bloated compared to where, what it should be, because, of course, we all know that we are the big emitters, um, not as big as the US, which has got a severe case of obesity in more than one way. Uh, and, it's dem and it demonstrates, of course, the inequities. Now, it's a bit of, uh, it's intended to be slightly humorous, uh, but it has a very real meaning behind it, demonstrating that there is a lot of inequity in terms of the contribution, as I'm sure you know. Now, if you look at um, where the impacts are likely to arise, so that last curve, the last map was about our emissions. Um, if you look at it in relation to where the impacts are likely to arise, they are very geographically uh, uneven. And what I'm going to show you on the next slide is um, taken from the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change fifth assessment report 
which is its summary of all of the risks. Um, and there are five, four bars shown, the present level of risk, what will happen in the near term, then what is likely to happen long term by the end of the century, 2080 to 2100, under two worlds, one of which there is warming of about two degrees Celsius, and one of which there is warming about four degrees Celsius. We're trying to limit ourselves to two degrees Celsius or less. Our current trajectory is closer to four degrees Celsius or more. And for each of those scenarios, it gives two levels of risk on a kind of scale here from very low to very high. And the blue bit is what we will get uh, if we adapt well. And the total bar length, including the gray bit, is, uh, is if we only have no more than our current level of adaptation. That, that is, we don't um, uh, put in place uh, much improved measures. So let's look at the global distribution. And you can see that the various forms of risk here, floods, heat, water problems, can, which can be uh, drought primarily and things of that kind, or um, and relating to crop failures. Uh, if you look across them, of, of course, for all of these, there is a gradation that the more severe the level of climate change, remember this is current, near term, two degrees Celsius by the end of the century, four degrees Celsius by the end of the century, there is greater and greater levels of risk. And actually, there are risks in all continents from all of them. No, no continent escapes, but there are probably appreciably bigger risks for some crucial uh, uh, problems such as food production. Sub-Saharan Africa at the moment is fairly heavily dependent on subsistence agriculture. Um, and even as we expect it to develop economically over this century, it's still likely to remain very dependent on local production of food. And in fact, it's pro projected to become, I think, one of the biggest food exporters over the course of this coming over this course of the century. And we think there, there is likely to be uh, appreciable burdens from uh, fe crop failures and adverse effects on uh, crop production. And the health consequences from that, um, I can't remember exactly what's gone into those calculations, uh, but are appreciable and uh, remain appreciable under almost any scenario. And the things which we tend to put into those calculations are those things which we know about directly. So they will include Temp direct temperature effects, they will include severe storm risks, um, they will include vector-borne disease, such as the spread of malaria, uh, but things like um, uh, crop failures and so on are, are hard to uh, model precisely, and so we don't know about them in detail. But those, remember what I said right at the very beginning, that there are these two levels of effects, there, there are the direct effects of, of um, uh, climate change, which is what was represented by those bars. But there is also the opportunity for improving health if around the world we manage to move towards the low carbon economy. And this is one graph representing that other side of the equation. So again, it breaks it down by regions of the world. It's taken from a recent report in the Lancet, uh, the Lancet Countdown, which publishes annually an assessment of our progress towards tackling climate change from a health perspective. And what this shows is the burden of deaths in all the regions of the world at the moment that arise because they're exposed to air pollution. And most of that air pollution would go away if we moved away from uh, dependence on fossil fuels. So let's take a look at the European region here. These are annual premature deaths from ambient PM2.5 concentrations per 100,000 inhabitants. And what you notice is that these different colored bars reflect contributions from different parts of the economy. From the power industry is blue. Uh, this is other industry. This is um, land-based transport, motor vehicles. This is household emissions. This is agriculture, all other things. And 
The first thing to notice is that every sector, of course, is contributing to our current ambient air pollution, and therefore to tackle ambient air pollution means action in all of those sectors. It's not just one. And in fact, very particularly, it's not just transport. Uh, this is the transport-related component of, of the fine particle pollution in, in, uh, in Europe at the moment. That's the totality. That bit alone is transport. And half of transport emissions aren't even combustion-related. We think of air pollution being the pollutants that come out of the tailpipe of the car. But in most European cities now, about half, and in some cases more than half, are not emissions from combustion that come out of the tailpipe of the car. They are fine particles generated by braking, small particles coming off the brake discs, and from uh, tire wear, small particles coming off the tires as you drive along the road surface. And braking emissions and tire wear won't go away even if we have electric, fuel, uh, electric vehicles because the combustion component will go, but those others will remain. For that reason, we should not expect, and it is unlikely to be true, that if we tackle the transport-related emissions, what we're likely to do is maybe halve that part. But the rest of it would remain. And that means, therefore, that for us to achieve the improvements in air quality, we have to tackle every sector. And that is also exactly what we have to do for climate change. That to uh, reduce our emissions of CO2, effectively, they are the same thing. It's burning of fossil fuels, uh, generates our greenhouse gas emissions, and generates also toxic air pollutants. But if we are successful in achieving that, we can expect most of this to disappear. These bars, therefore, in some sense, reflect the optimistic side because that is what will largely, not entirely, largely disappear as we switch towards the low carbon economy, as we move to clean methods of power generation, uh, clean ways to heat our homes, improvements in agriculture so that we don't have emissions from the agricultural sector. We use less ammonia fertilizers, for example, which are one of the big contributors to background concentrations of fine particles. All of those things will progressively help to improve our air quality. Globally, as you may know at the moment, about six million people die annually, prematurely, from exposure to outdoor or indoor air pollution. Most of that is avoidable. Most of that would go away with a transition to the low carbon economy. But of course, it requires big changes in all of those sectors, in all of those uh, countries. What about the socioeconomic dimension? Well, just to remind you, in case you needed reminding, um, this is taken, by the way, from the Gapminder project, which, if you've never used it, is a wonderful resource uh, developed by Hans Rösling at the um, Karolinska, Karolinska Institute in, in Sweden. And he's put together lots of data representing uh, a global database of various country characteristics. This is a plot of country-level CO2 emissions against uh, average income. The y-axis is on a semi-log scale, as is the, uh, the y-axis. And each bubble here is a country. And the bigger the bubble, the bigger the population. So you can tell, I think, that's probably uh, China and India. Um, and that up there is probably the United States and so on. So they're colored by the region of the World Health Organization. So I think green must be Europe. Is that right, or are we yellow? No, uh, sorry, green is the Americas. Yellow is Europe, I think. So we're all up here. But the first thing to remember is that there is almost a straight line graph between income and our level of CO2 emissions. And that is a, that's one of the most sobering observations of all, of course, is that even if we are wishing to reduce our CO2 emissions, now admittedly these data are a few years old, but it remains true that the wealthier you are, the more resources you command, and everything that you touch has embedded energy, and embedded energy means embedded CO2 emissions still. 
and there is virtually a straight line graph. So uh, the first thing is that the first antidote to global warming would, would be to make everyone poorer, but that's probably not a very attractive option for most of us. But it's a very straight line graph, and it's the same thing if you look at it against life expectancy against income. It's not perfect. There are some, you know, the United States dips down a bit. It's not as well off as in terms of life expectancy as you would imagine from its wealth. It should be up higher. But nonetheless, there is also a slightly less de well-defined but a straight-line graph for life expectancy in relation to wealth as well. Now, I mentioned air pollution, which, remember, is basically it's, it's a, there is a complete coincidence between greenhouse gas emissions and um, uh, ambient air pollution. This shows data for a random set of... Uh, uh, well, the database contains 250-odd cities... Um, from around the world, um, and this is their ambient concentrations of PM 2.5 pollution in relation to their per capita income. Now, uh, London is down here. Here is Paris. Um, I'm not sure where Valencia would be. You'd be down here somewhere. The red dotted line is the World Health Organization suggested guideline level for the annual average concentration that we should aspire to. There are some cities below it, but they tend to include ones in, uh, distant from other cities, so they include places like Stockholm and so on. But also, actually, San Francisco is very close, to, very close to being under the limit. It doesn't mean to say that they are entirely healthy. You still, there are still adverse health effects below 10 micrograms per cubic meter, but they're down to roughly where the WHO, region, uh, sorry, the WHO guidelines suggest we should all aspire to be. But you will notice how great the difference is. And here is Delhi. So the average concentrations of PM 2.5 air pollution in London is about 13, 13 micrograms per cubic meter. In Delhi, it is about 10 times higher, over 120, close to 130. Um, Beijing is there, which uh, for in the year this was taken was about 19 micrograms per cubic meter. But as I've mentioned already, it has been taking action year by year, and over the last six or seven years, it's come down about 10% per year, bit by bit by bit, and it's now almost halved that concentration as a result of its actions over the last half dozen years or so. What it also means is that as the cities, as you can see, as they generally get richer, the concentrations tend to fall, and that's largely because that's the name of the game. Remember that Kuznets curve that I showed you? There are se several different patterns that as you get richer, you change the nature of the, of the emissions, you change environmental standards and the exposure that we get exposed to. But as we get richer, we reduce community-level exposure, so air pollution goes down. But what I haven't got on here is that, that you could have exactly the opposite direction would be in relation to greenhouse gas emissions. So we have cleaner air from a toxic pollution point of view, but we are big emitters from um, uh, a CO2 point of view. Now, uh, I've shown on here, it's actually a smaller subset of the cities that I showed on the last slide, but it's also uh, just to make a point in terms of some of the equity issues, that some of the populations that are currently experiencing and are likely still for the next few decades to experience high levels of air pollution are also populations likely to experience very high temperatures. Um, this is a plot of what we predict, predict from global climate models to be the mean temperature of the hottest month in 2100. And it's based on, I think, 16 different global climate models. And to be clear, these temperatures are exactly what it says. This is not the hottest temperature of the day. It's not the hottest day of the month. It is the average temperature of the entire uh, month, day and night, every hour, added up and averaged. So there are cities here which are in the high 30s, the 40 Celsius or even higher. Average temperature, day and night, day after day for the whole month, the hottest month of the year. Now, those are very hot temperatures uh, to levels at which it becomes almost inconceivable that you could uh, maintain uh, any form of normal lifestyle. 
and in fact, frankly, are threats to health. Now, some of them aren't so surprising. They include some desert cities like Baghdad and so on. But notice a lot of these also include Delhi will have temperatures very close to having 40 Celsius average temperature for the hottest months of the year, day and night. Um, Amritsar, Bhopal, a lot of these are Indian cities which have some of the highest pollution now, but also some of the very highest levels of temperature by the end of the century. If you look beyond just the temperature effects towards um, uh, extreme weather, so this is the uh, uh, occurrence of deaths uh, and of other, uh, and, oh, sorry, of the occurrence of the events and of deaths in relation to storms. Now, this is retrospective data. It's taken from the Center for Research on the Epidemiology of Disasters, CRED, C-R-E-D, and it shows the kind of global breakdown. Now, this isn't projection data in the future. It's just showing what has been happening in the recent past. But I show this because there is a very big difference between pie chart A and pie chart B. This demonstrates that the, the orange here, or the, the darker orange, is the high-income countries. And 40% of the, of the major storm events of the world occur in the highest income settings. But if you look at the impact on the populations, only 4% of the total deaths attributable to extreme storms occur in those high income settings. So the dramatic difference between the occurrence of the event and the impact on the population health is very clear here. Whereas if you go to the low income settings, that's this one, this is where they only have 12% of the severe <laughs> storm events but the impact is uh, two-thirds of the global burden uh, of death. Um, and is representing one factor that even in a world in which the climate effects were entirely evenly distributed, which they won't be, the impact on the population is likely to be highly uneven because of the vulnerability of the population itself. So it's not just a question of who gets exposed most, and I made the point in the last slide about some populations such as those in India getting exposed to high temperatures most, but it's also the intrinsic vulnerability and the experience of the last few decades and of, of this, uh, which is, uh, I can't remember exactly what years this, oh yes, it tells you there, uh, 1994 to 2013. Um, over that period, they clearly have the bigger impact in low income settings because of their intrinsic vulnerability. What about generations? Um, one thing it's important to understand is, and it gives most of us uh, a glow of, of, uh, of achievement, I suppose. This is a statement taken from the uh, Lancet Commission on Planetary Health. And it begins with a very optimistic statement that far-reaching changes to the structure and function of the Earth's natural system represent a growing threat and yet, global health has mainly improved, which it has. If you look in most areas of the world, health has improved and has gathered pace. But the sting is the last part. The explanation is straightforward and sobering. We have been mortgaging the health of future generations to realize the economic and development gains of the present. Essentially, the first bit, the far-reaching changes of the structure and function of the Earth's natural systems, is a problem. We have been drawing on that in an unsustainable way. It has enabled us to feel good because it's improved our health now. It means it's, it's, it's underpinned the lifestyles to which we have become accustomed. And it has propelled many of those improvements that we all benefit from. But the cost is the debt. And the debt is for the future. So this is where the third dimension that I was going to mention the intergenerational one applies. And just let me remind you, um, you've probably had countless people speaking of, about where we are going or where we have failed to, to go, to remind you that we have yet, seriously as a global community, to make any dent on, the, uh, on tackling climate change. This is, um, this is kind of irrefutable evidence. If you, whatever you believe is what, what we're doing or how, we are, uh, how well we are doing ourselves, 
This is the concentrations of CO2 measured on the Hawaiian island of Mauna Loa, right in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, a long, long way from industry, where it is one of the best places in the world and the globe to measure the change in concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere. And this has been measured, um, and these data are uh, held by the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in California. And their record goes back to the 1950s. And you can see what's happening year by year. So it's just simply year along the x-axis. And notice it has a sawtooth pattern, and that's because if you look at the globe, there is more land mass in the northern hemisphere than in the southern hemisphere. So when we go into our summer, the growth of plants sucks out CO2 from the atmosphere, and there's a bit of a dip. But when we turn into our winter, that's all then released back into the atmosphere, and the CO2 go up again. So that causes the sawtooth. But the change in the sawtooth, you can see, is relentless and is going up and up and up. And I haven't put in the graph of this, but I have plenty of them. If you compute the difference from one year to the next, the rate of change of increase in the CO2 concentrations is getting bigger year by year still. So we haven't even yet begun to slow down the rate at which CO2 is changing in the atmosphere. It is still going up faster and faster and faster and faster, despite all of our actions to this point. And the reason for that, as you well know, with this sort of graph, is that we've been trying to, you know, here is the EU, this is now CO2 emissions against year, and we think we've been doing rather well in the EU, EU 28, soon maybe EU 27. Uh, the, the, this has been coming down is our per capita uh, or our total emissions. Um, actually, I can't remember whether it's per capita. It doesn't much matter. Uh, oh, no, it must be total. Um, but that is consumption-based. Uh, sorry, that is production-based, not consumption-based. That is what we produce. But part of the reason that we have been successful in bringing down our emissions is because all of the goods that we consume but import go on somebody else's account, not ours, which is unfair. And whose account does it go on? Well, it goes on places like China. So all we've been effectively doing is switching ourselves from here to here. At the same time, of course, China has been getting richer and developing economically, and so its emissions are going up. And the total, if you put it all together, is that there is a relentless uh, rise um, year on year, and there is still no indication that we are successfully managing to dent our global emissions. If you look over the last three or four decades, there are about four or five points at which you can see little downward ticks in global emissions of CO2. They are all corresponding to global economic downturns. So when we stop producing things because we suddenly hit a recession, there is a little dip but it rapidly picks up pace again, and the underlying trend is relentlessly upwards. Here is the per capita emission CO2, again, of the differences between them. And part of the issue here, of course, is the fairness about, well, who is generating what? So now, in terms of CO2 emissions, you can say, well, actually, hang on, the UK, we've been doing quite well. But that's the issue about the production versus the consumption debate. But that doesn't also look at the cumulative emissions, which is... Uh, one of the things that people argue about is sort of, well, where do you start from? Because, uh, of course, we have not been contributing to emissions just in the last 10 years. We've been doing it for decades and decades. This looks at, takes a baseline of 1970 or thereabouts um, and says, what have the cumulative emissions been since that point? And this is the trajectory for the USA. Here I've got the UK. And here is China. So at the moment... Uh, China is rising rapidly. We are our curve is getting flatter. China's curve is getting steeper. But in terms of the area, the total area of accumulative emissions, there is no contest. We in the UK and the USA would be far ahead of us are still much greater, for example, than the per capita cumulative contribution to the CO2 emissions. So there is a big unfairness in terms of... Uh, that legacy effect as well as who is contributing to it. 
Uh, we have been training for a long time. China is now beginning to join uh, at an on per capita basis on a like, like for like with cities in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, but that's also because they are big producers. Now this lag effect from the country also, also accounts for a la large effects if you look on individuals within the population and the differences between those um, older people who've now contributed most to the problem and the younger people who are now having to kind of deal with the problem. It'll be for them that the most of the effects of climate change arise and they who have to make the biggest changes uh, for, to improve health. But this is sometimes used as an argument saying, well, we, we don't need to act as fast because, in fairness, it's you in North America, in Europe, who must equitably move much further, much faster, because not only are you ahead now on the per capita basis, but if you look at it in terms of your contribution over time, the cumulative contribution over time, there is a very big, even bigger inequality uh, geographically around the world. Nonetheless, uh, I don't buy that as a very good argument for saying that anybody should slow down. The argument is, effectively, we are only going to be able to tackle the climate change problem if we all go about as fast as we possibly can without any constraint, without any fairness, and the only way that I can see that happening is if countries, cities, individuals act unilaterally in their own interest as well as the collective global interest to achieve the change. And I was at a meeting recently in Copenhagen, which I think is an example to us all. Copenhagen have been thinking about sustainability at least for, since at least 2002 and really before that. But since then, they've been putting in places to try and make their city sustainable. They uh, hosted, just a couple of weeks ago, the meeting of the C40 group of cities, which is a global network of cities trying to take climate leadership on climate change issues. And they are, they said publicly then, and have published in their documents and in the reports, that they intend to become a climate a zero carbon city by 2025. Just six years away. And I think they stand a chance of doing it. It won't be easy, and some of it will have to rely on offsetting rather than genuine lease, but they have made huge changes in all sorts of ways to improve their, uh, their use of energy and the CO2 emissions. And I put it to you, they did not have to do that or to be ahead of the pack in the way that they are. I'm very glad that they are where they are because more of us, frankly, need to be with them if we understand any chance of, of, of achieving the climate uh, targets. But there is not one person I would challenge you who would go to Copenhagen and say, oh, I don't like that. That doesn't look very nice. I, I wouldn't wish to live here. Um, it's a bad thing that you have made such efforts to clean up your city. From all perspectives, the things that they have put in place are very beneficial to their city. And one of them is in relation to transport, just as one of many examples. So, for example, they now, in Copenhagen, more than half the population cycle to work every day for their commute. Half. In London, we are still in single figures for cycling to work. It may be 9% or something along those lines. And I usually make the, the comment that actually, even if we had a large increase in cycling, we'd still not make much dent on the CO2 emissions because it won't change the overall volume of traffic. But in Copenhagen, it just might. It's already half of the commuting journeys are by cycle, and their ambition is to go much further. They want to get to 70%, 80% of journeys plus. Now, this was actually a piece of modeling work. I'm sorry, it's, it's a translation onto a PDF file of, of a slightly animated uh, slide, so that's why you get this, um, oh, sorry, that's why you get this uh, inset here. But what it's trying to do is make a, is draw a distinction about the benefits that come from that action to achieve the low carbon economy. So these are things you can do in transport. 
And essentially, this is a very simple thought experiment, but it's using real data and real evidence about what would be accomplished in London under one of two scenarios. And the first scenario is simply that we convert all of our petrol and diesel cars to electric or electric uh, hydrogen fuel cell. So zero um, emission cars, essentially. And that's what's referred to as lower carbon driving. The second is if half of journeys, less than 10 kilometers, are done by either public transport or by walking and cycling. And it's the walking and cycling bit that has the real benefit. So what you can't see behind here is, uh, is the full labeling here. This is a measure of health impact. And the higher you are, the bigger the gain. And what this is representing is that for lower carbon driving, where you get rid of the air pollution by not using petrol or diesel, you help to diminish particle concentrations in the atmosphere. But it's a small gain. And remember it's small because of the thing I pointed to several slides back, of the fact that transport is only one part of the contributor to particle air pollution in London. And then only half of that is combustion related. The other part is braking tire wear. For that reason, the impact of converting all of the vehicles in London to electric or hydrogen fuel cell is a gain in air quality. It does improve, but it doesn't improve dramatically. But enough to achieve that gain in, in health. But if we could encourage 50% of the people who make the journeys less than 10 kilometers to do so by walking or cycling or by public transport, the active modes within that, the walking and cycling, would have a dramatic effect on population health because it relates to the big core drivers of a lot of chronic illness. And that is the estimated size of the benefit. You don't really need to understand exactly what the scale is. It's a measure of a disability-adjusted life year, something that the World Health Organization uses to, to measure uh, impact on health, combining both mortality and morbidity. And it's a bigger blue blob than that one is. So in other words, getting rid of the air pollution by changing to a different fuel carrier is a small impact. Getting people more active in the way they travel would be a much greater impact on population health. And what, what, where does the impact come? It's for, for all these conditions. Ischemic heart disease would fall by 10 to 19%. Cerebrovascular disease, stroke, by a similar amount. Dementia risk, we think, by about 7 or 8%. Breast cancer and some other cancers, interestingly, by 12 or 13%. All of those would go down. There would, however, be, unless you segregate, there would be uh, an increase in ri risk of road traffic injuries, which is a problem. And it means we have to take action and be care to segregate and to protect cyclists and so on. But that level of shift uh, uh, would have very appreciable population benefits. And it is clearly achievable because Copenhagen does it. That is the Copenhagen scenario. And in fact, it's probably less than the Copenhagen scenario. Now, Copenhagen is, they have certain advantages. It's very flat, which is a big factor when you're cycling around. But one of the things that you will notice is how much they put cycling right at the core of their decision processes. Um, a slide I didn't put in, but there is one that, that shows when they consider they, any plan for transport development, they have this calculus of the social and economic benefits. And only one bit of that is about drive times and so on. The rest of it's about the benefit to health, of sense of well-being, of uh, you know, d not being disruptive to the local community and so on. And there is a set of about six or seven different forms of social impact which they measure, they estimate, and they use to help determine their investment. And how do they invest? Well, I don't know precisely. I haven't seen the whole thing. But one thing that, that inspired me a lot is that going, connecting two sides of the harbor, there is this architecturally elegant cycleway. It's just a nice, in a, in a very Scandinavian way, nice flowing curve bridge that goes across connecting the two sides of the harbor. It looks wonderful. It's the sort of thing that anyone would be delighted to cycle along. It, there's no traffic around. It's for cyclists only. This isn't cars plus cyclists squashed along the side. This is cyclists only. 
and they have put it for, uh, in, the, in the front, and they will likely be gaining all of those sorts of benefits. And because they've got segregated cycle waves, they're probably diminishing this bit at the bottom, which is harmful. One last example. Um, diets. Now, okay, this is UK-based, but it's exactly the same in principle for any uh, setting. And as you know, there are uh, all the foods that we eat have embedded in them energy of production, which, as you may recall, contributes also to ambient air pollution, largely because of ammonia fertilizers and things. But this is the greenhouse gas emissions, uh, tons of CO2 per ton of carcass mass. And essentially, the things on the right-hand side, these are the ruminants. They give rise to methane in particular, and so that's why you get the CO2 equivalent large footprint. And uh, it is four, four or five times larger than, for example, than having chicken. Now, this is one example, but it means that if we can make a small shift away from our consumption of things like beef, milk products, and so on, we would have an appreciable uh, benefit to health as well. Now, you may not be able to see the detail of this, but this is an analysis of uh, different levels of cutting greenhouse gases compared to the current diet. The red bar is, the, uh, yeah, is um, how much we consume at the moment, and then you've got how much you would need if you wanted to bring about different levels of greenhouse gas reduction. Notice that the yellow one is zero greenhouse gas reduction, but is just made healthier diet. Okay, so there's no ambition to cut greenhouse gases. That's just saying, let's make the UK diet healthier. Then the green one is, now we have a target we need to reduce the emissions relating to our food consumption by 20%, 40%, 60%. Now, it turns out that, first of all, this one where there is no ambition to reduce greenhouse gases, but we want to make our diet healthier, actually does result in a greenhouse gas reduction. That if we ate according to the principles of a healthy diet, that would already save about 17% of greenhouse gas emissions for the UK diet. And you can bring about a 20 to 40% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions reduction by relatively modest shifts in the dietary pattern. This is not wholesale change. It is proportionate reductions in red meats, in dairy, increases in vegetable intake, and so on. And you can see those changes. Oops, sorry. You can see those changes by the length of these bars here. So the green one is a 20% targeted reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. And you can see it's meant that reducing red meat, it's not eliminating it, it's not going vegan or vegetarian, it's cutting by maybe, what's that, a quarter to a third. Um, it, there's a bigger change here in the meat and uh, in uh, dairy production and so on, but some of these are very small. Obviously the things that gain are the vegetable uh, increases, the big reductions are things like soft drinks, dairy, red meat. Those are changes that are well within the scope of changes which have already happened, but in reverse, over the last few decades in the UK. And they are therefore the sorts of changes that could easily be accomplishable. Now, I can't show you the data exactly for Spain, but for a bet, it will look an awful lot like this, because things which are based on the red meat and so on, if those could be cut a little, it would, uh, it would add to, uh, it would certainly improve the greenhouse gas footprint and likely be beneficial for health, even though the uh, Spanish diet will be closer to the, the, uh, the ideal of the Mediterranean diet, which is probably healthy in general. But there is almost certainly plenty that can be done through relatively modest shifts in dietary manipulation, which would be quite palatable to most people, which would have a big impact on climate change and would improve health. That's all I was really going to say. Um, so just to summarize, climate change has multiple implications for human health, relating both to the consequences of climate change itself, which we fail to stop, but also because of the health impacts aimed at those actions where we try to mitigate, where we do try to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. 
there are multiple sources of inequalities in environmental exposure with respect to socioeconomic status, geography, and, and across generations with regard to the climate action, with regard to the climate problem. But also that means that there are, if you reverse it by taking climate action, that we are likely to see the reverse of that, that there are greater gains in those disadvantaged populations who are likely otherwise to suffer the most. Actions to limit the impact of climate change do not necessarily help reduce inequalities for which specific safeguards are needed. But I put it to you that in general, it is, uh, there would be population-wide consequences of most of the large changes we need to, uh, need to do to meet the climate challenges. And were we successful in a, being able to implement them, there would be very measurable, tangible improvements in the quality of life and the health of our populations. So climate change is a major challenge, make no mistake, probably the greatest challenge we face. Uh, but it is also a unique opportunity, probably the greatest opportunity for improvement in health and quality of life for us all that we are likely to see throughout any of our lifetimes. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. So now we open the floor to make questions. Alguno de ustedes quiere hacer cuestiones, preguntas al Profesor Wilkinson. First of all, I think that, um, from my point of view, that objective from Copenhagen to meet uh, cycles only. It seems, uh, it sounds like paradise, but I'm not sure that in the, for example, in Spain, where we have some cities already trying to, uh, to get the population, get used to use cycles to, to improve the traffic and the pollution, levels of pollution, so it's not so easy because cities are not designed to, you know, to, to share the same space, the cars, motorcycles, cycles, and so, but do you think really they are able to, to reach that objective? Um, well, yeah, I mean, a very good question, and, and I'm not sure I know the answer, really. Um, whenever I think about responses to climate change, I, on the one hand, both get depressed, but also very optimistic. The depression is that if you look at all the hard data, we have yet to begin to bend the curve downwards. And we need to get it coming downwards rapidly. Um, I didn't show you what, what one of the most pessimistic curves of all, which is the target that we need to do to achieve a one half degree Celsius target agreed in Paris a few years ago. That would require a dramatic reduction from next year. It's called deadline 2020 because by 2020 we need to have emissions coming down dramatically and to reach close to zero by 2030. Global average. Uh, now that seems very infeasible. Um, it may not be quite so stringent because if you allow for negative emissions, and there are ways in which you can have negative emissions by, for example, planting lots of forests, by scrubbing CO2 from the atmosphere and so on, you can allow a much slower trajectory of, of decline. But the challenge is nonetheless huge. There is no, no country, uh, maybe Bhutan, I'm not sure, but there is no country other than Bhutan that I think could claim anywhere close to being uh, on the trajectory for zero emissions. So that's a depression bit. On the other hand, there are clearly uh, many countries, many cities, many areas that are now trying to do a lot. And what I think is inspiring by, uh, about places such as Copenhagen is that they clearly have done what most of us think is impossible. What they have done, though, is not overnight. Uh, they say, as very plainly, they have been thinking about this for two or three decades, possibly longer. And it's part of their kind of Scandinavian mentality of the way to think about problems for thinking of ways that, uh, to improve social well-being, to, to take action in all the ways that they need to to address what they perceive to be urgent priorities. And the difference is that in everything that they look at, 
it is the top priority. The climate change, the action to it, how to improve the quality of the environment, how to make real step changes, it's there all the time. And um, I should have shown you this, that, that, that's that slide of the things, that the criteria they use for assessing their impact. So they don't just build a new road, they look at what the social consequences of it are, and they look at it against the alternatives. And they concluded long ago that if they invest centrally, they put front walking, cycling, livable cities, that eventually you get to the point where, you, where that is what is reality. It is the thing that takes center stage. It's not that there is, they've added on a cycle lane to a busy road. They have decided cycling and walking and livable cities is what they want to achieve, and that is their primary goal. And because of that, bit by bit, the direction has shifted. When you start from where we are at the moment, and it's certainly true also in London, you think, how on earth do you squeeze in more bike lanes and so on? But that is possible if you have the right mentality about giving simple priority and just changing your perspective and saying, no, we can't have cars, we can't do this, we've got to do it in other ways. Now, cycling in, is only one example, and of course, there are other reasons why sometimes it's more complicated to cycle. I, one of the other advantages that Copenhagen has to being flat is that it's also quite a cool climate, and that makes it easier to cycle, whereas if you get a very hot climate, it, it's less comfortable to cycle, of course. And that uh, will also weigh against things. But we shouldn't get so fixated just on the, on the issue of uh, cycling. Cycling is good because it has public health benefits, as I try to demonstrate. But it is one very small piece in the jigsaw of how to tackle the climate change problem overall. If we were to manage to succeed in changing all our motor vehicles away from petrol and diesel to electric or hydrogen fuel cell, that would be a very welcome improvement. Our air would be cleaner. It wouldn't be as big an improvement, but it would be a collective and substantial uh, improvement in health and well-being of our uh, population. The air would look cleaner. Uh, we would feel it's pleasanter to walk around in the cities. And you can add on to that many other steps and things which people are trying to do, you know, making cities greener, improving the quality of housing, lots of different things, uh, reducing polluting industries, and so on. Each one is only a small piece in the jigsaw, but if you have the right frame of mind and priority, then I think you can uh, achieve the, what seems to many of us now almost an impossible achievement. And so cycling may be a, a kind of, you know, it is one example, it's not necessarily appropriate for everywhere. But I use it because what it exemplifies if you want to do it. You can do it in some settings, it may be they have advantages, but it's not just because they have advantages, it's because that is what they chose to do. And it is for any of us, any of our cities, any of our population, to choose which direction we wish to go. And the thing that seems to me is that very few parts of what we might achieve would be unattractive. People grumble about it all because they don't like change and it seems disruptive and how are we going to replace this, but you know, I challenge anybody to go to Copenhagen and say, no, this, do this doesn't look right. I wouldn't want to live here. This is, how dare they improve the quality of the environment like this? It's a good thing. And I think most of us will probably, because I'm sure these changes will come almost everywhere eventually. It's a question of how fast. When they have come, we will look back and say, can you remember the days when we used to have dirty, polluting vehicles and when there wasn't space for people to walk and cycle and how our homes were very inefficient and we used to heat by burning things and we had polluting industries near our city centers and, and there was flood risks and this, you know. It will, we will look back and think how much better that we are now uh, in the future than we are today. Um, so it all can be done, I think. Uh, it is a question of mindset of what you wish to give priority to. Good afternoon. Yeah, it was really a good, a very, a very interesting presentation. Thank you very much. Um, the question I, I, I put after this, uh, this first question of uh, 
of Macarena is, uh, well, I have on mind an example of Copenhagen. It has to have in mind that it's a wealthy yeah. city, a wealthy country. And uh, that means that it's not only to be with a you want to, or you have, have decided to do, uh, or, or just go on that way, it's just if you can do it. In the sense of uh, uh, equitable distribution of uh, environment, risk, risk and uh, responsibilities, and this uh, slide that you put on, you know, very, very uh, easy to see which countries has just been much more bigger on, uh, on, uh, in, the, in the pollution uh, of all of the atmosphere in the world. I mean, it's, the atmosphere is a, mm -hmm. is, is a, is a global mm -hmm. thing. So uh, in that sense, do you think there is a, a way that uh, wealthiest countries and uh, uh, geo regions and I mean, in a, in, a, in, a, in a global and international solution could help in, or, must, or must help uh, others not so yeah. wealthy well, on, on that way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I guess I'll just follow in Copenhagen development. Yeah, I, I, well, uh, I mean, firstly, I'm sure Copenhagen would be embarrassed. Well, maybe they'd be very pleased, but they'd be slightly embarrassed, I think, to be held up as such a paragon. And they aren't perfect. They still have substantial greenhouse gas emissions at the moment, but they have great ambitions. So, um, and a number of other cities, including my own in London, we, we've already pledged to become carbon neutral. And the UK, I'm pleased to say, is the first country in the world that has a law requiring us to become carbon neutral um, by mid-century. With regard to low-income settings, uh, th there are a number of points to make. The first of which is, um, I hope that they won't go through the same trajectory of dirty development that we all went through. And they don't need to. The, the world is a very... Uh, intercommunicating place. You can learn and adopt. There are new technologies that mean that they don't have to go through the same stages of uh, dirty technology that we, ha that we went through in the West. And if you look back 50, 60, 70 years in European cities, they were filthy. Um, in my field of epidemiology, environmental epidemiology, probably the most famous episode of anything was the 1952 smog episode that w resulted because uh, at the time we had such uh, polluting uh, atmosphere, we had a, a particular meteorological conditions, and we had intense smog such that you could barely see from one side of the street to the other. And people got lost on their way home on routes that they used to take every day because they simply could not identify where they were. Thousands of people died, and it was very clear you could see that from the statistics. Now, we had that because, at that time, we heated houses by burning things, burning coal, wood in fireplaces. And if you look still, a lot of houses around the central area of L London have lots of chimney pots. They used to burn them. But also, we had power stations right in the center of the, of the, of the city. You may know Tate Modern Art Gallery. Well, Tate Modern Art Gallery on the south bank of the Thames is actually... Uh, the Bankside Power Station, coal burning power station, which in the 1930s and 40s and 50s used to burn coal and emit its emissions right in the center of London. Now, that was the technology we had at the, de at the time. Now we have alternatives. We, uh, and along with many uh, richer countries, have been successfully moving our way from dirty electricity generation and now an increasingly high fraction of it is generated by renewable means. And it used to be said, of course, but those renewable means are more expensive. That is no longer the case. Uh, it is now cheaper to generate electricity by some renewable means than it is, for example, by coal-fired power stations. And it is uh, for that reason that there is now pressure on some of the coal generators in Central Europe, a place in Poland and elsewhere, where they've got large resources of, of dirty coal, lignite, and other uh, sources, and, but it's uneconomic to run them because the alternatives are cleaner and cheaper. 
and they're becoming cheaper because the investment is now going into the development of that te technology, developing it at scale, and so on. I do not see any reason why any country, therefore, needs to go through a phase of investing more and more in old-fashioned technologies. It seems to me now that it's, there is no good case, especially for developing of coal-fired power stations, for example, or for not going for renewable forms of generation for all industry because they uh, short-circuit many of the lessons we learned the hard way when we did not have the opportunity, we did not have the technology. But now we do, and that can be transferred. The knowledge is there, the know-how is there, the economics are there, frankly. What is missing is the scale of capital investment. But there are multiple schemes uh, that allow for the transfer of resources to invest in low-income settings so that they can develop at large scale with multi-million dollar schemes, multi-tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars schemes uh, to help them develop in ways which have much lower impact. So, of course, a lot of the stuff that they will still do um, from their own resources will still be relatively dirty. But I think that the case is becoming more and more powerful, that they need not develop in those ways, that there are technological solutions that mean, which are cheaper and cleaner and better for them, and that there will be demand for that change. I mentioned the example of how much China has been improving, and one of the big reasons for that improvement is because as the country has become richer, so the population has changed its expectations and demands. And whilst it was once upon a time happy, while it was developing rapidly from a very low base, happy to see that it had polluting industry, it no longer is acceptable. And so the Chinese government, impressively, has decided it must and is doing so. It's tackling that, that problem very rapidly and it's coming down at an astonishing rate by about a 10% reduction year on year over the last six or seven years in most Chinese cities. That same pressure will apply to anywhere, to India, countries in Africa, and so on, if it develops in a way that uses old technology, and suddenly it will find itself in a decade or two decades' time when people will want it all reversed. So there are all sorts of pressures from the population. The opportunity is there with the technology, which is cheaper. The pressure will be there from the local population as they get richer and develop. The need is there collectively at a global scale, and there are mechanisms, maybe not sufficiently large, but there are mechanisms for large-scale transfer of resources to help develop clean development schemes by the things such as the Green Climate Fund and so on. There is still a huge problem to be met, but all the ingredients are there for good action, and that is one of the reasons I also remain optimistic that actually when a lot of low-income countries start to s consider exactly what investment they're going to make, there will be opportunities, there will be mechanisms that will mean that very often they can do so in much more enlightened ways that bypass all of the, of the poor history that we went through. And thank God that there are those opportunities because I think it's what we all need collectively to be able to achieve some of these climate targets, but at the same time it will help improve local population health because of the immediate benefits they gain. Sorry. Thank you so much. I'm afraid we have to close that session. And I thank you so much, Professor Wilkinson, to share with us this, your time and your knowledge. Um, we have uh, realized that we have many challenges to afford, <laughs> but uh, it's only a, question, a matter of time. We have to do it, sure. and thank you so much.